great teachers. I was thinking <coughs> about all the great supposed teachers and meditation teachers and all of the admirable uh, spiritual and uh, let's say uh, psychological or uh, happiness teachers life advisory services and all of these supposed happy people who seem to be teaching others and at the same time as far as you can see at least if you look in the media making lots of money and getting really famous out of it and looking at great teachers and masters of the past uh, this is um, mainly going to focus on meditation and spiritual teachers or psychological advisories which is the same as a spiritual teacher really because it's all about peace and happiness and getting rid of stress and fear fear of death or whatever <clears throat> and so thinking about myself every morning I suffer a, something that's probably incurable and which isn't even defined properly which is called ADHD or ADD which is something like um, attention deficit it's usually in children, but it happens in adults. It gets carried through into the adult time. And there are hundreds of thousands of adults around the world who don't know they have it, have been suffering through life, trying to get on as if they're walking through mud or swimming against the stream because society uh, is not designed for people with ADHD. <coughs> and... Um, Anyway, ADHD, you know, is just something, they have different forms of it. So if you're like this with that and do this that way, then you've got ADHD, this kind. But if you're like that and like this, then you've got kind B or C or D. And actually, I, I don't believe even in these categories or diseases. They're not diseases or illnesses. They're just names given and called illnesses for people who don't actually function in the way society tries to force you to function and that uh, humans are conditioned to see reality in a past, a present and a future a beginning, a middle and an end which people with ADHD don't have hmm? so people know me as Ajahn Spencer a lot of people ask me for tips and tricks about meditation or about Dharma how to practice as so if I told you, well, I, in the mornings when I wake up, even when I'm still rubbing my eyes and haven't washed my face yet, and still stumbling around looking in the kitchen, trying to get my eyes open to see through the blurry haze where the coffee can is and the milk so I can make myself a coffee. <clears throat> but inside me, there's a jackhammer. There's this thing beating away and it's already planned the next 15 steps of the day and even the first simple steps like pouring the coffee can into the cup which I will mix with milk just dilute it a bit because I shake if I drink a lot of coffee um, I have this habit of washing the coffee can out of coffee and throwing it into a big basket and uh, we recycle all the coffee cans. We have one for plastic, one for metal coffee cans. And so while I'm pouring my coffee, my heart is already getting very, very tense and excited. It feels like a jackhammer because it's already wanting to wash the coffee can while I'm still pouring it into the cup. I can't wash it yet. I haven't finished pouring it. But because I have no past, present and future or beginning, middle and end, I want to do everything at the same time, which is impossible, of course. And so there's a, a very tense, frustrated feeling inside, even in the morning, and especially in the morning, which I have to calm in my own way, which uh, I use meditation and focus on the breath and different methods. But when the condition is extreme even the most powerful meditation won't still it because it's become physically embedded its actual physical reactions and it's very very difficult to still <clears throat> so I have my ways of stilling it 
one is with medicine and the other is with meditation so there you go you have an Ajahn, a supposed Ajahn, who gives tips and tricks on meditation, talking about a personal problem he has. Mm? And uh, this is where most of the teachings or the information about Dharma I have ever shared has never come from a book. And it's never come from a stance of uh, pretending or claiming that I have mastered it myself or that I'm already there and that I don't suffer a teaching on how to avoid suffering from me comes from my own experience how I have found out how to um, dilute or evade or lessen the suffering uh, based also upon what I learned from the Dharma of the Buddha the Buddha Dhamma and, but I don't take it from the book of the Buddha Dhamma I take the Buddha Dhamma, practice it and Whatever experiences I have, I will share, <clears throat> including the bad ones. Because if you want to teach people about how to stop suffering, you have to know suffering yourself. If you've never suffered yourself, how can you teach someone to free suffering? The Buddha suffered like heck. And that's how he found out the way out, because he accepted suffering, realized he was suffering, and decided to heal himself as his own doctor. I've been to a lot of doctors, none of them can heal me. They can't even heal themselves and they just classify me with something on a piece of paper and book which doesn't really tell them how I am or who I am or what makes me tick inside. Anyway, back to all the teachers, the start of this talk. I take a teacher, it's not good to name particular people because it's like you're making karma with them, you're criticizing them or whatever, but I'm going to do it just to make this easier to understand. I look at teachers like Eckhard Tolle. He's always calm, he's always happy. He never makes a mistake. He never talks about something he did wrong. Because he's a teacher, teachers don't do something wrong. They have to keep an image. There's a billionaire industry around him. I mean, if you subscribe to him, the next thing your email inbox is getting offers for courses for how many thousands of dollars and oh, this guy of back to yoga guy who got accused of fiddling and diddling with some of the little girls in his cult in his yoga cult who's not a yogi or anything he's just a Hollywood cash in and all these people giving teachings as, and never show themselves as having some kind of flaws or imperfections. For me, that's a fake teacher. There's no such thing as a person without a flaw or an imperfection or who doesn't get angry sometimes or sometimes just say something wrong or makes a mistake they regret. <clears throat> but all of these teachers never seem to, that we see on TV and that are famous and in magazines, they never seem to make a mistake which I think is, uh, if I see a teacher that is never any visible mistake, then I would say there's something to suspect. <clears throat> Even the Buddha made a mistake by making a decision and then he changed his mind about the decision once. Uh, but uh, some of these teachers, they don't even make those mistakes. We're highly suspicious. Why do teachers not make mistakes, or why do they hide their mistakes from their disciples and their and their um, students and followers? Is that because if you make a mistake, you're not worthy to be a teacher? I think if you've never made a mistake, you're not worthy to be a teacher, because teachings come from the mistakes you've learned from, not from a book. <clears throat> And so why don't these teachers ever talk about mistakes they've learned from or how they deal with their own problems, how they overcome their own problems. And so um, I like to talk about my own problems and how I overcome them and how I deal with them because that's helpful. <coughs> and it's not pretentious that one is perfect. And I think it's become a falsity because of these fake teachers who pretend that they never make a mistake that most followers expect the teacher then to be perfect and never make a mistake. And instead of following the teachings, they follow the teacher. 
which is a really big mistake because if you follow the teacher and you watch him 24 hours a day you will see him make a mistake and you'll lose faith in the teacher if that's what you expect the teacher to be perfect according to his teachings <clears throat> you better go look for the Buddha himself if you want to see that if not don't watch the teacher look at the teachings and see if they work for you but there's too many people looking at the teachers and there's too many teachers who seem to be too perfect why are they so perfect because they're hiding their imperfections why are they hiding their imperfections because they don't know themselves yet and because they're scared of losing their paying disciples and any teacher who takes payments anyway for his teachings, unless he's a kung fu teacher, or a martial arts teacher, swimming teacher or whatever, but if he's a teacher of dharma, of the path to the cessation of suffering under the Buddha Dhamma, <coughs> then he should never make money about it, over it, and he should just distribute it freely. And you look at people like Eckhart Tolle or the Maharishi or these groups of Transcendental Meditation with jo Dr. John Hagelin who are taking non-self and flipping it back into self and letting the self still survive within the non-self of things and just reviving the ego. This Dharma for movie stars, Dharma for Hollywood and Beverly Hills people, Dharma for people with money and to me that's just yoga pants on instagram you know that's not yoga either people wearing fashionable yoga pants with the latest yoga mat doing a pose of themselves in a sexy pose and paying instagram to get more likes there's nothing spiritual about it and now we have <coughs> the ayahuasca the ayahuasca shaman all i can think about is how when the tattooing industry became open to getting machines and training from like five tattoo shops per town, it turned into 150 tattoo shops per town and all of these people, oh, I'll become a tattoo artist, new industry, new jobs for everyone. Then people went to Thailand and the Bahamas and did a dive course and then they do a dive master course and then they think they'll stay in that country for a while as a dive master working just for some board and lodging when they should be being paid millions, uh, thousands of dollars a month as a dive master. Instead they're abused to get some free board and lodging and stay in Thailand longer and be a dive master. Then they get their dive masters thing and they go home and open up their own diving school or somebody comes to Thailand and does a martial arts course or a Krabika Bong or a Muay Thai course and fight a few fights and then get a little diploma paper from whatever school they went to and go home and open up a boxing studio. Now I've got some friends who've got some real Muay Thai boxing studios. I'm not talking about them. They're real seriously good fighters and serious Muay Thai looks it of true teachers I exclude these people they know who I'm talking about but even they themselves also laugh at this phenomenon that there are millions of people well hundreds and thousands of people who are not Muay Thai warriors with experience and worthy of being teachers and just come get themselves the minimum take the photo get the certificate go home and open up a Muay Thai school it's called exploitation of finding something to exploit it's evolution and it's the nature of all animals to find out how to exploit your environment for survival it's actually not evil or sinful but it is defilement according to the buddha it's a defilement which influences our behavior but it's a defilement we call it defilement spiritually scientifically i would call it the instinct to survive and to recognize and see opportunity in one's environment so it's not simple it's just an effect that happens it's how fashions happen it's how the diving business happened it's how the muay thai the spread of muay thai studios happened and it's definitely i'm going to be more critical about this how the spread of yoga and yoga mats happened 
from all of these poor fakeries, half of them faker yogis in India, seeing the tourists coming, offering their special ashrams, and people coming and doing it and saying that I have finished a course with the ashram with the Mahabhakti ripoff, and I'm now opening my little ashram at home. I'm going to do some Reiki healing, or I'm going to do some this, that, and the other. And now we have this with the ayahuasca shamans. Now I can see all over the world now there are people, it's a fashion, going to do ayahuasca with a shaman teacher who's been with the Indians and come home and his name's John Smith, but he's changed it to Ayabuga Hangaluga or whatever, the shaman. And he opens his little shaman thing and... He lets people take ayahuasca and he takes them on their journey and then brainwashes them with whatever he wants to influence them with and they go home thinking they've found their spiritual animal. And there's nothing spiritual about it. It's a business that's grown up out of a very spiritual, cultural, uh, thousands of years old practice which the West is now making an industry out of it, just like yoga pants, yoga mats and all the rest of that shit, henna painting hands and God knows what. Yeah, and I would seriously advise, do not go and confuse yourself on an ayahuasca shaman course. Are you talking to a person who was initiated into Wiccan and Hermetic Magic in about the early 1980s? Yeah. And I also read, by the time I was 16 or 17, I'd read all of the books of Carlos Castaneda and taken magic mushrooms in brute force. We're talking about three quarters of a kilo of dried magic psilocybin mushrooms, which I took handfuls of every day and stuffed them in my mouth and boiled them in Milo and coffee and tea. And for three weeks, spent myself completely tripping my head out on those mushrooms and peyote and cactus and all of that kind of things. I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times. And I did it as an occult practitioner, sat within an occult temple, within the temple room with all the ritual objects and performed the rituals on the mushrooms and had the experiences. And the first thing I'd say is, don't let this thing become a fashion because if everybody goes and does that, half of the people are going to go insane because only a well-trained, strong mind with the protections trained into them can do that kind of thing. And it's very dangerous and it's why I don't do it anymore. And it does not lead you to enlightenment, but it does give you insight into how illusory this world we usually perceive is. And it is life-changing but there's a business being made out of it. And the way to do it is not to go to some shaman ayahuasca course. If people want to know about ayahuasca or about tripping psychedelic, psychotropic substances and the spiritual experiences you can have, I'll talk about it another day, because I've had thousands of them. I spent from the age of 17 to about the age of 25 tripping my head off. Yeah, and I had a lot of people to guide me along the way. I know what Timothy Leary's um, teaching on how to go up and come down is, which is also wrong, but I did that, the psychedelic experience. uh, And these ayahuasca masters are confusing a lot of people in the world. There are no ayahuasca masters except for a few shaman somewhere in Central and South America and in a few other places of the world. And it's not something you can market, and it's being marketed. And so many of my friends are saying, I've just been or I'm going to this ayahuasca thing to find myself. You look at Jim Carrey, a lot of the things he's true, he's saying there is nobody there, there is just happening, there is no me. He's talking like the Buddha saying there there is no self. The thing is, he will say the table doesn't exist who say there is just this and that. But the Buddha himself said that he who only accepts the objective reality of the emptiness of everything, 
but who does not accept the assumed fake reality which we need for communication and interaction in the world, such as, can you pass me the gravy, please? Jim Carrey would say, there is no such thing as gravy. There is just everything happening all at once and there's nobody here to experience it. He's seen non-self, but he's now denied the other truth of assumed reality. And the Buddha said, anybody who is like that, he may have seen the not-self and the emptiness behind the universe, but he's gone crazy because he has ceased to accept the other side of the universe, which is the assumed side, where we watch TV and play imaginary roles all day in our imaginary world with imaginary things like money and the value of gold and the value of oil and stuff like that. It's all imaginary. Any banker will tell you that the value of gold and money is completely imaginary. It's just something that every government has decided to agree on and it works because we agree on it. Otherwise, it's imaginary. You know, Jim Carrey is one of these Maharishi guys who pays for these really expensive courses with these Bhakti Yoga, whoever they are, Maharishi, John Hagelin, Oprah Winfrey and all of these. But he's just got confused. I mean, I once deliberately sought a serious question to find out what answer this, uh, what's his name, Eckhart Tolle, would give to one of the most difficult questions, which is how to deal with my own anger. And his answer to the devotee or the student was to punch a cushion. Punching a cushion doesn't get rid of anger. All it does is displace it. But it doesn't get rid of the root of anger. The Buddha would never have taught somebody to get rid of anger by punch punching a cushion. It just proves he has understood nothing. He sits there, he's a very good actor, and he pretends to be calm, talks about himself and his own achievements, doesn't talk about his mistakes and where he slipped up today, as if he never slipped up since his supposed enlightenment, and tells people to punch cushions to get rid of anger. I would say to get rid of anger, you have to do a lot of things over a lot of years. Firstly, meditation. When you meditate and when you're angry, notice how hot it feels inside and notice it's suffering. Notice after the anger has gone how much regret you have inside yourself. Um, notice what makes you angry. Follow in meditation to see that before the anger comes a thought and that what triggers the thought and to see how thought can change your emotions into happiness and anger and then learn how to control your thoughts to not allow them to go to places which will um, spur your anger and give you techniques to actually think about and contemplate them in the right way whilst meditating and slowly without promises that it's going to happen overnight tell you that over years you will be able to diminish and get, diminish the anger and gain control over it and uh, prevent it from externalizing. But it's not an easy teaching. You can just answer somebody from a stage in a podium and say, oh, just punch a cushion. These are all fake teachers. And the only real teacher, I would say, would show his imperfections. And so I started off talking about one of my imperfections is that every morning I wake up before I've even rubbed my eyes open, I have this jackhammer inside me that's trying to do the five things I can't do until I've done the first thing. Because an ADHD person doesn't have a beginning, uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, beginning, middle and end. We live in the present moment and we want to do everything exactly in the moment we think of it. And if we're busy doing something else when we think of doing the other thing, there is a rushy, panicky feeling inside that will suffer until you get to do it and the mind is always planning ahead five six seven things after you finish this and the heart of a person with ADHD as I have it does it's very hard to still and so sometimes it's so heavy that I have even had to still rubbing my eyes tired as heck take a, what they call them, a stress tablet, such as a Valium or something like that. First thing in the morning, which makes you drowsy, but it stills the effect. 
Other times I've just used breath meditation if my power was enough to just focus on my breath and notice how panicky it's become because of my inner state and just watch the breath and focus and breathe more slowly and slowly calm the breath and the emotion then slows and I found out through investigation that from my own personal problem I follow the thought I see the thought is what has made the panicky feeling arise or the angry feeling or the sad feeling depending what I've thought and that the feeling then makes my breath change and the rhythm of my breath change and slow or get erratic or get deep or get panicky and so I reverse engineer it as soon as I realize I'm suffering and that I'm in a state and I become conscious of it the first thing I do is look at my breath and see what state it's in and say oh my god slow down breathe in put breathe out tall breathe in put Breathe out door, buddha, buddha, buddha. You can say tomato if you want, if you're not a Buddhist. You can say Allah if you want, Allah, Allah, or buddha, or Jesus, or Yesu, or just even melon, or chocolate. Doesn't matter, you can be an atheist and find a mantra to help it. I don't use a mantra, I just use so if I notice my breath I hope you could hear that if I notice my breath <laughs> obviously I'm agitated so when you see yourself going Notice it, say, look at my breath, stop, stop. <sighs> Slow it down. Focus on the breath. And notice as you're focusing on the breath and slowing it down, making it nice and deep and relaxed. how your emotion also relaxes and how as your breath is now controlled your emotions become stilled too with the stilling of the breath comes the stilling of emotion with the stilling of emotion the thoughts become clear and the stilling of the disturbing thoughts also reduces and you can see how the re disturbing thought caused the disturbing emotion which then caused the disturbance of breath and so if you find yourself angry to change it you have to realize you're angry and suffering you have to recognize suffering in that first that the person you're angry at is not suffering you are and realize how intense notice contemplate how intense your own inner suffering is so that you want to get rid of it and then when you've reached that point, then you do what I just said. When you're angry, if you really want to get rid of anger and you realize how much you suffer, one day when you're being angry, you'll realize in the middle of it. And that's when to look at your breath and look at the state of it and then just control it. Just go, okay, breathe in. You know, like my mum used to say, and your mum probably too, take ten, three deep breaths or count to ten. Take three deep breaths and count to ten. This saying is a very old saying and they say it in most countries and cultures of the world. There's a reason for it and it's like Vipassana. So you do that. When you find yourself angry and suffering, take more than three deep breaths. Just take, keep taking regular breaths, natural breaths, and bring your breath back to natural state. And as you're doing it, notice how your emotion reflects your breathing, because it was your erratic breathing that was reflecting your erratic emotion. And your erratic emotion was reflecting your erratic thought. And so it comes from thought. The Buddha said, all things spring from mind. 
all things all phenomena spring from mind and so mind generates emotional reaction and emotional reaction affects the breath and so by controlling the breath you can then tame your emotional reaction and by controlling your thoughts also you can tame them from the root because the root is the thought the emotion is the reaction and the breath is the proliferated reaction you can slow down the emotional reaction through reverse engineering by breath control which will then calm the emotion to allow your mind to be able to use your mind control but the best way is to never let the mind wander into dark places or wander into stressful places if you let the mind think about things which will affect your emotional reactions in ways which are unpleasant which are afflictive emotions which will cause afflictive emotions then you are creating dukkha and its causes by thinking of them but you can reverse engineer them first by calming the breath until you have mastered your mind when you have mastered your mind you will never let the mind go to those places anymore and that's what I've learned from my mistakes and my imperfection and I'd just like to consider how many people who I'm not really considered a teacher well by some people perhaps but I don't consider myself a teacher but I look at all these supposed great teachers and I don't hear them speak of their own mistakes or try to teach how they deal with their own mistakes they just teach others how to deal with the mistakes they say they have <clears throat> but they never mention the fact that they themselves have their own mistakes to deal with and that's the only way you learn to deal with mistakes and teach others how to deal with them is to confront your own mistakes and conquer them and so if I'm a teacher or I'm an Ajahn, I'd say I'm an imperfect Ajahn with a lot of mistakes who, which I work on, and that's what I share with you. But to the other Ajahns who never make mistakes, apparently, I really would not know what to say, except that I don't believe them, because nobody's that perfect. So I think uh, some of them have good teachings, but they should stop hiding their own imperfections and show that they are human and imperfect that was the Buddha's lesson he was a human he perfected himself and became a Buddha and the lesson was that because he was an imperfect human that shows we can all do it and that's part of the message but these guys are pretending to be perfect so it's as if oh they can do it but you can't do it so just pay them for some teachings well there you are great teachers lots of them in this world with great names whose names will be heard of very far in the future. My name is hardly known and will be forgotten. And I don't consider myself a teacher. But if those guys are teachers, then I'm a professor, which I'm not. But anyway, I share my mistakes and what I learn from them and how I learn to deal with them. The teachers I see on TV, they don't share their mistakes. They just tell people how to deal with their own mistakes by punching cushions to get rid of anger. <laughs> well, that was my morning thought during my attack of ADHD because I haven't washed my face yet. I have had my coffee, but uh, this drive led me to make this podcast because it was one of the thousand things in my head at the time whilst I'm sat trying to wake up great teachers so many great teachers in the world and that's the end of this critical and strange podcast Ajahn Spencer once again signing off